If you look at South Africa, the grid's failing. So a lot of the research has gone into, well, what about microgrids? There's a lot of hydro that's just there. And rather than building some huge dam, which is actually not that great for the environment, floods whole river valleys, it takes massive amounts of carbon to create those dams in the first place. Um, but if you build local hydro grids, microgrids, then it's much better for the environment and it empowers local communities, 1,000, 2,000 people at a time. I reckon in five years, we're going to start to see massive fulfillment of Bitcoin's potential to bring energy abundance to entire continents. And that's one of the things that really excites me. Daniel has spent years in the Bitcoin industry advocating for its role in reducing methane emissions and debunking mainstream media myths about Bitcoin's environmental impact. As a passionate researcher and venture capitalist, Daniel is making a tangible difference in Bitcoin's hash rate with his environmental initiatives. He often draws parallels between Bitcoin mining and solar technology, highlighting how both industries initially produced high emissions before evolving to reduce them. In this video, Daniel explores how electricity grids function and why there's significant resistance to the growing supply of renewable sources. He explains how Bitcoin can address this challenge by providing an economic incentive to develop and utilize renewable energy when supply exceeds demand. This approach allows renewable projects to attract investors by demonstrating faster profitability and aiding grid operators in their quest to manage the electric grid. This is a must watch conversation as Daniel reveals how these environmental benefits could significantly impact Bitcoin's price, noting that the ESG acceptance of this asset class would unlock over $3 trillion of inflows. But before we do that, I want to introduce our sponsors, Stampseed, the Orange Pill app, and Swan. Our partners are businesses and people that we respect and our products that we at Bit Intelligence personally use. You're watching 21 Voices. Let's imagine that you're um, some potential lender and I come to you with a proposition. I say, right, I want to start a solar farm. You say, OK, tell me more. Um, how are you going to get into connect to the grid? Oh, well, we, we, we're going to have to wait by about uh, 3.6 years. You're saying, OK, what are you going to do in the meantime? How are you going to earn revenue? Oh, we're not. And then you say, what's your probability of getting onto the grid afterwards? And we say, well, about 15%. So, okay, so there's a 3.6 year wait and then for a 15% chance of getting onto the grid, in the meantime, you've got no revenue. It's not looking so promising, is it? The grid operators are freaking out because they know every time you put variable renewable energy onto the grid, it makes their job of stabilizing the grid harder. So whilst officially they're saying, yes, we support the green energy transition, unofficially, their job primarily is to keep the grid stable. And so a gas project is going to make the grid more stable than a renewable energy project. Now, you think that's bad? Try doing that in the UK. They're getting dates in the 2040s, sometimes even the 2050s, in terms of when they can interconnect to the grid for their wind projects. So how do you get around that? Well, the only way you can get around that is if you have a technology that can, number one, increase your probability that you'll get onto the grid, and number two, that'll give you some revenue source whilst you're waiting. Now, here's the problem. Most solar farms and wind farms are in the wrong place. They're nowhere near where population centres are. They're where near cheap landers, which is never urban centres. If you look at Texas, for example, all the population lives in eastern Texas. All the solar and wind farms are in western Texas. Why? There's a lot of sun there. There's a lot of wind there. There's a lot of cheap land there. Now, you've got a problem. How do you get them profitable before they even get connected onto the grid? Well, the beautiful thing about Bitcoin mining is it's location agnostic. So they can sit there right next to the solar farm, right next to the wind farm. You try doing that with any other asset. How many other businesses do you know that are going to sit in the middle of a desert and run their business there? Not a hospital. Probably not even a traditional data center because they need a good internet connection. But Bitcoin mining companies, it's not important. You just set up your Starlink and away you go. So they can be location agnostic. They can sit out there right next to the solar farm or the wind farm, and they will pay them maybe two cent per kilowatt for that electricity, which gives them money before they get onto the grid. Now you come to the private equity person, you say, it's going to take us 3.6 years, and that 3.6 years will be earning revenue at two cents in the kilowatt hour, which gives us this much money. Plus, we'll have a good chance of getting onto the grid because we're stabilizing the intermittency of our renewable energy. Now I'm going to say, okay, tell me more. So it makes it a much more viable proposition. And the second benefit is about transmitting that energy. 
Now, sometimes we forget, because we live in this wireless world, that the grid is still wired. It requires wires to transform energy. At some point in the time, we may get around that and work out how to do it without wires, but we haven't figured that out yet. So it needs wires. And the grid is like a highway. It only has so much capacity. Um, and the only way to build more capacity is you have to invest a lot in infrastructure. Just like roads, you have to build two more lanes. We don't have lanes, but you certainly have to upgrade your cables and your substations to be able to take more. And that costs deca millions, centimillions, millions, sometimes even billions of dollars to do. You've got aging grids and you have people who don't have the money to invest. So what do you do? Well, again, if you have someone who can take off that energy uh, so that you don't have to transport it, you've got a customer. There's an example recently in Germany where there was 96 hours of peak wind in northern Germany, but the population was in southern Germany, and those wind operators had to send, after the first four hours, they were able to store some in batteries, but after four hours, that's the capacity of most industrial batteries, the other 92 hours they just had to waste because they couldn't transport it through the grid. If they'd had Bitcoin mining companies there, they could have been worrying up, they could have been using all that spare energy and they could have been getting paid well for it. So it's not just a time of day agnostic that it uses it when no one else wants it, it uses it where no one else can access it. So it turns out that it's just the most beautifully synergistic partner for these renewable operators that are producing uh, energy when other people can't use it or where other people can't use it has struggles to get onto the grid, has struggles to convince grid owners to take more intermittent energy at a time where they're trying to stabilize the grid. And it solves so many of those problems. And not just partially solves them, but in some cases completely solves them. But if you actually talk to the people who uh, know grids intimately, such as Brad Jones, who was the grid operator for Texas, who held no Bitcoin, who was brought on for the express purpose to stabilize the, the Texas grid after winter storm Uri and the blackouts of 2021, I think it was, and he did two things. So he used weatherizing of the generation equipment to tackle the supply side. On the demand side, he looked at demand response and said, how can we get people to lower their electricity consumption when we need it at a blink of an eye? And he evaluated a whole lot of methodologies including uh, smartphones with things where consumers could turn off the traditional means, which is an aluminum factory or a steel plant, who they ring up. The grid owner says, oh, look, we've reached peak power. Can you please throttle down? And they say, yes, and it's going to take about an hour. They say, oh, can you do it any faster, please? We're kind of in a panic here. And they say, we'll see what we can do. And that buys them about four hours. But you can't get more than that because steel starts to harden. Uh, but it buys them four hours to then do some other things. And then he looked at this thing called Bitcoin mining, which was kind of new. He'd never heard of it. And he, and he said, tell me more about it. And he talked to some of the Bitcoin mining companies. He said, OK, how fast can you power down? They said, within a minute. He's like, OK. I said, how, how much control do you have about how much energy you can give? The Bitcoin miner said, no, we can power down to exactly what you need because there's all these atomic units and we just choose how many to shut off. And he's like, OK. Third question, how long can you shut off for? Um, can you do as much as four hours? They said, well, we can do as long as you want because we're a discrete process. We don't lose anything. We don't, we're don't. we not like an algorithm that's halfway through that if you shut it off, you lose it. Um, it's a discrete process that's running trillions of times per second. So you lose nothing other than the Bitcoin that we were mining, which is relatively small compared to the benefit that we're giving back to you. And he said, okay, we need you guys. Can you be part of our demand response program? And we will pay you for the ability to switch off. And there was your New York Times headline. Bitcoin miners paid to not mine Bitcoin. Please bear with us for a quick message from our sponsors. These videos take a lot of time to make, and we've partnered with brands we trust like Stampseed and the Orange Pill app in order to get the funding we need to bring you these videos every week. Don't store your Bitcoin in cold storage without stamping your seed phrase on an indestructible titanium plate. Stampseed is fireproof, rust-proof, impact-proof, and easy to hide. It has no loose parts and will give you ultimate peace of mind that your Bitcoin is safe and sound for the long term. Click the link in the description below for 15% off your stamping kit. When I finally got Bitcoin, it hit me like a lightning bolt. It was the currency of the future, the only money that truly mattered. But there was a problem. I didn't know anyone else that thought like me. That is until I discovered the Orange Pill app. Suddenly, I was connected with a network of like-minded Bitcoin enthusiasts right in my own city. The Orange Pill app is more than just a social network. It's a community of passionate individuals determined to change the world one Satoshi at a time.
This series is brought to you by Swan and created by Bit Intelligence. Remember to like this video and subscribe to both our channels for more videos like this every week. Thanks for watching. So the sensationalist headline, they were doing all this benefit, they were helping stabilize the grid, they were giving a more powerful lever to stop blackouts and save lives and loss of business than ever before, and the headline was Bitcoin miners paid shut off. Now the reality is, you get paid to shut off anyway, it's called insurance, it's called demand response, it's been around for ages. Even the New York Times has talked about the wonders of demand response, except when it comes to Bitcoin, which can do it better than anyone else, it turns out. So it has this tremendous grid stabilization ability. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't increase prices, it actually reduces them because now it, it's uh, free market dynamics. You now have a competitor for demand response you never had before entering into the market. The key thing here is that you can't store energy unless you have batteries, and even batteries only store it for four hours. And electricity has to be supplied by wires, so a grid operator has to be constantly matching supply and demand at all times. If one gets above the other, this way or this way, you can have too little demand and that can result in blackouts. So the grid operator, their primary responsibility is not at any cost to let that fail. And th as you pile more variable renewable energy onto the network, good for the environment, yes, but really bad for grid stability because now you're replacing a source of electricity generation such as coal or such as uh, gas which you could crank it up or crank it down at any time with something that's utterly dependent on nature. And so they need demand response more than ever before. That flexible consumer of energy that can power up and power down. And there's been a study that's shown that when you have flexible customers of energy, that allows the grid operator to put more renewable energy onto the grid because they have certainty that the, the inflexibility of supply can be matched by flexibility of demand. And this is not just Bitcoin is speculating about this anymore. This is what the grid operator of Texas said he observed firsthand. And it's now been backed up in a paper from Cornell University, which said they studied what was happening. And they said, yes, categorically, when you have Bitcoin mining in composite with renewable energy, it makes the renewable operators more profitable. And they use those profits like any business does to expand their business, which means more renewable energy on the grid. So it happens a couple of ways. You get more renewable energy on the grid because the grid operator isn't freaking out about more renewables coming on because they've got a solution to be able to counterbalance and basically act like a ballast against the intermittency of those renewables. So they can say, okay, we've got this much demand response now, we can have this much more renewables on the grid. So that can happen. The second way is that you now have a customer for that renewable energy that will pay and establish a certain base price for that electricity that you didn't have before. So because Bitcoin mining is a uh, very flexible about where it locates and when it uses energy, it can use it when no one else wants it, such as in the middle of the night where wind is often at its peak in certain parts of the country when no one wants it and it would otherwise be wasted. The Bitcoin mining companies can pick that up, can use it more for profits for the renewable operators. Or solar in the middle of the day when no one wants it, for the most part. And so again, Bitcoin mining companies can use that energy that otherwise would have spilled into the ground, makes the renewable operators more profitable again. So the argument goes like this, oh well, sure Bitcoin mining is using renewable energy, but that's taking the renewable energy away from more worthy users of it. And that argument relies on two things. Number one, that you don't talk about the utility of Bitcoin ever so that people still have the belief that it does nothing useful other than as a speculative asset. Um, so you have to make sure people don't discover its uses. Uh, but the second thing is you're presenting it as a zero-sum game, whereas if Bitcoin uses, others can't. But that's ridiculous. That's like saying, hey, look, the amount of food that's eaten by ants each year, we could feed a third world country. Well, no, you can't because it's all crumbs and you can't just get it together and ship it over there. So it's, it's wasted energy, it's wasted food, and Bitcoin is using a lot of wasted energy, energy that no one else can use. There is an inboard economic incentive to use energy that other people don't want and to not use it when other people do want it. You use energy that other people can't use, can't access because it's really cheap and you stop using it when other people want it because when everyone wants it, wholesale electricity prices spike and it becomes unprofitable to mine. So you power down. Inbuilt economic incentive, it's just, it's not because Bitcoin mining companies are trying to do something good for the environment, for the most part, it's simply profit. But fortunately those profit incentives are working in a way 
which is making things greener, not less green. It's luck because 20 years ago, uh, the cheapest form of energy would not be renewables, it would be fossil fuel. And so 20 years ago, Bitcoin was doing this, it would still be a non-rival user of energy, but the cheap power it would be seeking out would be mostly coal and gas. Whereas the cheap power it's seeking out today, it's heavily weighted towards renewables. And once you factor in the off-grid mining, Bitcoin mining is now using a minimum of 55% sustainable energy. And that's an incredible transition that's gone up from the 30s just four years ago. So it's phenomenal, the rate of increase. Now they say, okay, we can invest in this because this has shown legitimately that it has the potential to abate more emissions than it creates. And so in order to unlock that 23 trillion of ESG fund capital, now it's not going to unlock all of it. They'll do like a 2.5 to 3% asset allocation. Allocate that much of their AUM, 2.5% of 23 trillion. If you look at the dollar invested per increase in market cap, which kind of is, is a bit of a sign function, uh, but it's it's about a $4.5 ratio at the moment. So it would increase Bitcoin's market cap to $3 trillion. So pretty significant. So it'd be very good for Bitcoin. It would also be very good for the environment though. And it would also be very good for the ESG funds because right now we know from the PricewaterhouseCoopers survey that 30% of them are really struggling to find exactly what you're saying, something that gives them both a good financial return and that legitimately ticks the ESG boxes. The environmental utility, most of its potential, but some of it is real right now. It's already mitigating methane. It's already stabilizing grids. It's already making renewable operators more profitable. It's already allowing people in Africa to start up micro, micro hydro projects and get energy abundance where beforehand they didn't. Sometimes people say, well, it's all future potential. Well, yeah, a lot of it's future potential, like any technology, but you could use that at any point in time against any technology as an argument. But it's also shown incredible traction towards proving that potential. If we to do a true evaluation, other than just doing research to confirm your confirmation bias, that's what you do. You look at it and you look at the positive utilities and you say, okay, this is actually showing real signs of promise, both socially and environmentally. And in terms of the G side, the governance side, it's the best form of governance there is. It's engineered algorithmically, it's corruption free. Bitcoin mining is the leading force driving the global transition to renewable energy, independent of government subsidies. It's already making a difference. And if more industry leaders prioritize this transition, we'll look back at this decade as the dawn of a new era of prosperity for humanity. Follow Daniel on X for the latest environmental data and enjoy his debunking of mainstream media's misconceptions. Stay tuned and remember to subscribe for the latest recaps, insights, and films about all things Bitcoin. This is 21 Voices. If you want to watch another episode, try this one here.